I'm going to talk to you about A.K. Ramanujam, who is one of the well-known Indian English poets. Ramanujan had his early education in India, in Mysore particularly, and later on went to America, where he became a professor of linguistics in the University of Chicago. Good friend of Saul Bellow, the American novelist, and of course, probably India's greatest cultural ambassador as far as linguistics and anthropology and related subjects go. He was in the forefront of research into Indian folklore. And he knew several languages, Sanskrit, Tamil, Kannada, and of course, other languages which would help him to understand these languages better. What he did was to delve into the Indian past and then to translate from those texts into beautiful English. He went on record as having said that he was not very clear where the inner forms with which he was involved and those inner forms have to do with the structures of thought of Sanskrit, Kannada and Tamil with which he was of course deeply engaged. He didn't know whether those inner forms ended at a particular point and the outer forms that is his professional engagement with linguistics and anthropology and of course the English language. Where was the point at which the inner form ended and the outer form began? Or where did the outer form end and the inner form begin? And this of course is very central to translation work. When you are thinking, you're already translating. And here is Ramanujan, a linguist of you know, great excellence, who manages to convey to the Western world something of the flavor of the great Indian culture and the classics of India. He translated from the Tamil, for example, and from the Kannada. And so this act of translation produced from him extraordinarily evocative works in English. But then Ramanujan was also a poet who wrote in English, originally in English, so to speak. And that is why we call him one of our preeminent Indian English poets. For example, the first poem I want to deal with is called The Striders. It's from his early work. And Ramanujan had published this in the 1960s, I think. And it was a very highly anthologized piece. In any anthology of Indian English poetry, you're likely to find the Striders as one of the pieces chosen from Ramanujan's fairly extensive bit of writing. Now, the Striders are water insects, okay? And these are to be found, or at least they are well known in New England. Now, someone who knows something about New England might be able to tell us what New England is and where is New England to be found? Well, the earliest British settlements in America, like Boston and Jamestown, yeah. that region was known as New England yes. in general. For That's right, time. absolutely right. There, they used the name striders for these water insects. Okay? And the poem is about a water insect, about a strider. And look at the manner in which Ramanujan is able to you know, elaborate or expound the qualities of a water insect. Most poetry is all about some very high subject. People want to think about, you know, great subjects like God or justice or love or whatever. But here is a poet who is looking at a water insect and writing about it. And you can see that the writing is also very detailed, very acute, very accurate in its observation. We'll come back to that point in a minute. Let me read the poem for you. The Striders, and search for certain thin-stemmed, bubble-eyed water bugs. See them perch on dry capillary legs, weightless on the ripple skin of a stream. No, not only prophets walk on water. This bug sits on a landslide of lights and drowns eye-deep into its tiny strip of sky. Now, I think the first observation which one would make is that 
the observer. The poet is an observer. He's obviously walking around somewhere in New England, maybe Boston. So let's now try and understand the poem line by line. And search. Look at the way he starts the poem. It's as though he's in the middle of a conversation with you. And we have lost the early parts of the conversation. And search for certain, he's telling you. And search for certain, which means he's been telling you something about these water insects. And we don't know anything about it. And the poem suddenly begins almost like in media res, that is in the middle of the action. Right? Remember the great epics? Many of them start in the middle of the action, not in the beginning. The beginning of an epic is always the middle <laughs> in some funny way, right? So here you have that kind of a, a conversational ease, a wonderful natural way of getting into the spirit of the poem, the spirit of the subject. And he says, and search for certain thin stemmed. He's giving you a beautiful description. Thin stemmed, bubble eyed, the water bubbles. And the eyes of the insect are also seem to be like bubbles, right? So bubble eyed water bugs. So when I say water insect, I could also say water bugs, because he uses the term bugs a couple of times in the poem. And search for certain thin-stemmed, bubble-eyed water bugs. See them. It's constantly about vision, about seeing. Behold her single in the field. See, see, see all the time. All right? See them. Perch. And that's why the entire poem is about the you know, visual impact. It's like a picture which is, which is being drawn. It's a word picture. It's an image. All right? I'll come to that point about the image in a while. See them perch on dry capillary legs. Does anyone know the meaning of capillary? It's about hairy matters. It's hair-like, capillary. Right? I checked up the dictionary before I came to the class. And dry capillary legs. So the legs of the water bug look like a piece of hair. Uh, something which can go into a tube without any difficulty, you know, that kind of thing. So bubble-eyed water bugs, see them perch, perching precariously on the water, but on dry capillary legs. Water, but still dry. Weightless, they don't seem to be sinking. They are weightless. They seem to be floating on the water, on the ripple skin of a stream. Look at the wonderful expression, ripple skin. The stream is like a body, and the water which is rippling is like the ripple, rippling skin, of shining skin. And the visual impact is immediate, isn't it? And you almost come alive. The entire scene comes alive for you, almost as though you're standing with Ramanujan in Boston, watching a river and watching these insects playing about on the water. And then he goes on to give you a caveat. No. Not only prophets walk on water. Now, who are the prophets who have walked on water? Can you tell me? Christ walked on water. Yes, absolutely. And the Bible, we have many instances of this kind of thing. Miracles. Jesus walking on the river. Anyone in India? Do you know the story of Adi Shankara? He had a disciple. Yes. Do you know the name of the disciple? Padmapada. Exactly. Very good. Very good. So Padmapada, Jesus, and I think there are many other cultures where I'm sure we'll hear about great men and women who were able to defy the laws of nature, so to speak, and walk on water. Padmapada, because as, as he walked on the water, lotuses keep, kept uh, you know, cropping up. It was wonderful, right? No, not only prophets walk on water, even water bugs walk on water. Now, what does it mean to talk about something so... Uh, you know, uh, sublime as a prophet, and then compare the prophet to a water insect. Does it tell us something about the poet's attitude to life? You have something to say about that, the attitude to life of the poet here. Is he uh, downgrading the prophets? I think he gives importance to the tiniest elements. To tiny, life. small matters of the universe. Yeah. Prophets exist. They are part of the expense account of society. It's a luxury which society may, might need to you know, uh, uh, have. But when it comes to small things, these are really the part of our society. I think there's some such value judgment being passed, uh, not openly, but in a very emotive, associative, suggestive way. So no, 
not only profit, and he's still in the stalking mode, isn't it? He's still giving you a conversation, having a conversation with you. No, not only prophets walk on water. This bug sits on a landslide of lights. Landslide of lights? Look at that expression. Lights coming from where? From the big buildings which are around the river. I just talked about Boston, the monuments and the great buildings and so on. And those lights must be shining on the lake. Just like the lights shine on the Hussein Sagar Lake on an evening walk in the tank bund, you'll see this. You can see the lights shining on the lake, reflecting on the river, on the, on the lake. And then the sky and the lake seem to be one and the same. This bug sits on a landslide of light. There are so many lights. It's almost like as though the land is sliding. You know, we have landslides in the mountains when there is a heavy thunder shower or whatever. Similarly here you have a kind of a, a tremendous overpowering a surge of lights, illumination. Could this illumination be some spiritual illumination also? Apart from being just lights, it could also mean some revelation of some wonderful experience in life. I think Ramanujan is playing with these ideas. And I think we should be alive to all these associations of words when we read a poem. A poem is a field of force. It's uh, an, you know, a web of words. And it's words illuminating one another, each one gaining strength from its proximity to another word and then the meanings of those words. And words are not just single, uh, single in their meaning. They have multiple meanings. That is why we talk of the connotative you know, aspects of poetry. Okay? So this bug sits on a landslide of lights and drowns eye deep, just the eye <laughs> falling into the water, so to speak. That's all. It doesn't seem to be deep, going right into the water or anything and drowns eye deep into its tiny strip of sky because it's a tiny insect all that it can see is only this much of the sky which its eyes can see only this much of the water which its eyes can see and it seems to be drowning only to that little extent it's a small ordinary creature and yet it gives so much delight and here is a poem which is almost a word picture of that particular experience of seeing a water bug a strider and water insect on the banks of a river isn't it lovely? This kind of poetry is what uh, in the early part of the 20th century we called imagist. Does anyone know about imagism as a movement? It was one of the first organized modernist poetry movements and involved figures like Ezra Pound and H.T. And uh, images emphasized precision in writing. Yes, absolutely. So their poems are like a series of images drawn out with uh, precise diction. Yes. And you remember that wonderful poem of Ezra Pound about the metro and the uh, sight of a huge crowd of people in a station when you're going in the metro. And then they look like, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, a wet leaf on a wet black bough. Remember that lovely line? It's very visually, very, very particular, very specific. And no deeper meanings are necessarily available in that poem. If you're going to look here, and then think that this is a poem, an allegory about God and this and that, I think you're missing the point. You're simply seeing an experience. And let's savor the experience in all its beauty, in all its completeness. Move on from here to another poem. And this is called Breaded Fish. Would anyone like to read the poem for me? That may be a good idea, right? Especially for me, she had some breaded fish, even thrust a blunt-headed smelt into my mouth and looked hurt when I could neither sit nor eat, as a hood of memory like a coil on a heath opened in my eyes. A dark half-naked length of women, dead on the bench in a yard of cloth, dry, rolled by the ebb, breaded by the grained indifference of sand. I headed for the shore, my heart beating in my mouth. I headed for the shore. That sounds like an American kind of English, isn't it? Heading somewhere, heading east, heading west. In English, in English English, I think people don't use the term headed. So here is America, <laughs> and, and, and Ramanujan who's living in America, using the English language as though he's a Native American, headed. All right, anyway, let's get back to the poem. Breaded fish, obviously a sandwich, okay? With bread, which is whole bread perhaps, with grains, and you know, it's all very crunchy and very healthy. They say the more grains, the better for you. Whole grains, even better, all right? 
cholesterol will be reduced and so on and so forth. Sometimes they take the joy out of your life by making you eat all this stuff. Especially for me, she had some breaded fish. So clearly we know that there is a protagonist in the poem and there's somebody who has been doing something for him or her. We don't know whether the protagonist is a man or a woman, but one assumes that if somebody is making breaded fish for somebody, it could possibly be for the husband or the loved one or whatever, or maybe the mother for the child. We don't know, all right? Especially for me, especially for me. Look at that. And here again, there is a kind of natural way of getting into the, into the spirit of the, uh, of the poem. He's not giving you any preliminaries. Especially for me, she had some breaded fish. So the fish is put into the bread as a kind of a sandwich and given to you. Even thrust, she was so insistent that I should eat it, she even thrust a blunt-headed smelt into my mouth. What is smelt? Does anyone know what smelt is? What is smelt? Smelt is a fish mm. that kind of smells like cu cucumber. Cucumber, right. Oh, great. You know that. And it's uh, very close to a salmon. Yeah. All right. So you have... And it's a blunt-headed smelt. But look at the choice of the word smelt, because there's also smell involved in the idea of smelt, right? But here it's a noun, smelt. It's smelt, it's a noun, okay? Blunt-headed smelt into my mouth. And then what happened? She looked hurt when I could neither sit nor eat. So you can see the beginnings of some kind of a love poem here, I think. Here is a woman who is insisting that you eat well. And then when you don't want to eat it, she gets very hurt. Now, why would someone get so, so terribly hurt if you don't want to eat? Some people say, go to hell, don't eat. But here is a woman who is insistent and worried that you're not eating. So it must be some relationship. I think we can at least assume that much. We don't know what the relationship is. We don't know whether it's a husband and wife. We don't know whether they are lovers. We don't know. But there is a relationship. And this is beautifully evoked by expressions like this. So, and looked hurt when I could neither sit nor eat. And look at the expression, as a hood of memory, like a coil on a heath opened in my eyes. Right? As she looked hurt, I was going through a psychological experience of remembering something in my life 